I wanted to just remind you again that God loves you, and I don't mean that tritefully, that I love you, and uh, we have come to some important truth in the Word of God today. It just kind of reminds me, there was a number of times, maybe a small number of times, where I had to call my family together and, and uh, just talk with them and instruct them, and we come to a phenomenal passage in the scripture. I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians, and we're going to be uh, in chapter 5 in verses 1 through 7, expressly in 3 through 7. If you're visiting today, this is what we do. We exposit from the scripture. I had planned to preach this last week, but Dr. Moeller was here, and so we have been expositing each and every week through the Word of God. In fact, I've got on my notes here, this is message number 57, and um, we come to this really uh, amazing text of Scripture. Let me read it for you, and we'll continue in our exposition. Paul says in 5.1, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. Let's bow in a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate his word. Father, we come before you. This is for our church family. This is what we come to in consecutive exposition. Father, this is for us. Paul, uh, in pinning this under your inspiration, pinned it to the saints who are at Ephesus. And so we need that at Grace Church of the Valley today. Would you fall on our hearts and the power of the word of God by your spirit that we might walk in a manner holy, Father, based on all the love that you have given us to us in the person of Christ. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, today we really come in this consecutive exposition to one of the most forthright statements in all of the scripture on sexual immorality. This is a word, as I mentioned in my prayer, to our church, a word that is addressed to the church at Ephesus, and therefore it's addressed to us. And maybe even before we proceed with the exposition, maybe I could just ask you the question, what's at stake in all of this? As you hear this going forward, well, clearly, what's at stake in all of this is fundamentally, foundationally, the glory of God. You remember, if you look back in chapter 3, 1, Paul said there, to him, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Remember, it was that that became a little bit of a transition, a wheel, a hub that opened the door into chapter 4. So what's at stake here is the glory of God. What Paul communicates to us is for the glory of God, namely his fame, namely his honor. In fact, all that was said in chapter 4 was built off the unity and the purity of the church, and we articulated that and took some weeks to to do so. And I, I would also say maybe it was also for our joy, certainly in what you hear Paul say to you this day, is not to be some cosmic killjoy. Our God has joy and blessing and happiness and certainly holiness all over this text. But he told us in 321, to him be the glory. And then he began to tell us how to do that. You remember in chapter 4, verse 1, he told us to walk worthy. 
In other words, this continual uh, life of persistence moving towards Christ's likeness. You walk worthy. Then he told us in chapter 4 and verse 17 to not walk like the Gentiles. You can see that, uh, that, like the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Then he'll tell us again in a couple weeks, if you will, to walk in light. Then he'll tell us it's 5.8. And then in 5.15, he's going to tell us to walk in wisdom. And really what you need to see, and you can't go forward until you recognize what we said last week. Look at the beginning of verse 2. He tells us there to walk in love. And we spent some time not only on imitating God, but walking in the manner of love with which Christ loved us. We said last week he loved us willingly. He loved us unconditionally. He loved us sacrificially. And the thought would be there is that we're to walk in the same manner as he walked in. But it looks back to his death on the cross that he died in your place. He suffered the wrath of God. He loves you so much with such a pure love that he stepped in to do what you could never do. And that's redeem yourself. And so far from being accosted by soldiers or by some kind of political court, he laid down his life willingly for you. He died for you unconditionally. And what we mean there is he died when you were not righteous. He died when we were yet, it says he died for us and he demonstrates his own love and that while we were yet sinners. And then we said that he died sacrificially. He gave his very life for us. And beloved, as we move forward, if Christ walked in sacrificial love, then here's the thought. If he gave himself for us, then how could we ever follow the perversion of the world's love? And so here's what he's doing in the text. After giving us two positive commands, namely to imitate God, his character, his likeness, And secondly, to imitate Christ and his love. After giving us those positive commandments to walk in love, he now begins to move in the text towards a negative tone. Now, I don't need to apologize for that. Some things in Scripture are going to exhort us what to stay away from. Look at the tone, and you you probably heard it when I read it from you. It says in verse 3 about those three vice sins of perversion, they must not even be named among you. Look at verse 4, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. Look at verse 5, the judgment there that the one who lives that way at the end of 5 has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you. Which means as I speak, there are people who are seeking to deceive you. There are people who are saying things not according to the scripture, and we'll address that. And then look at verse 7, another, I suppose, negative. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. So, beloved, after two positive commands in 5, 1, and 2, he delivers two negative warnings that are utterly alien, if you will, foreign to true love. He goes from the imitation of God's character, from the imitation of Christ's love, here's how I've titled it, to the perversion of love. Now, he gives us two warnings. He gives us the first warning to beware of the perversion of sexual sin, and then he gives another one, beware of the certainty of judgment and We'll get as far as we can today. I always want to be clear with you and not skip over these things. But here's the first warning. Beware of the perversion of sexual sin. Again, look at verse 3 and we'll pick up the text. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Now you'll note the first word there in verse 3, but right? He's creating a contrast, what he just said so proactively and positively, and he's going to show us what is opposed to sacrificial love, 
It is the abandonment of sacrificial love and the moving to a perverted love. And he's going to say in all these words that I described, don't even let it be named among you, okay? Let's begin to look at those words. Maybe just touch on them. They come to us in a list, and yet the words matter. Look again at verse 3. He says, but sexual immorality. And he's going to say, go on to say, don't let it be named. But obviously the context is crucial here. In the city of Ephesus, they had a, they had a Greek goddess. Her name was Diana. I mentioned this on the opening message. She was either Artemis or Diana. She was a fertility goddess where sexual sins were a part of the temple life. Like, you think this is bad? Go read the church. Go read the city of Ephesus. There was adulterous relationships. There were men sleeping with young slave girls. There was incest, there was prostitution, there was homosexuality, and it was all part of the daily temple life. So here Paul, not surprising, after he talks about the beauty of God's love and the design of that love, he begins to show us the perversion. He says, but sexual immorality, and I think you know that the Greek word there is pornea. It's obviously the word that we get pornography from. Pornea, sexual immorality in the ESV, is any illicit sexual activity in act or thought that is in contrast to God's pure gift of intimacy between a man and a woman only found in marriage. In other words, it is unlawful or illicit activity both in act, obviously, but thought that is in contrast to God's pure and holy gift that he gave to a man and woman in chapter 5 in the context of marriage. That would include, let me tell you what it means, all illicit sexual perversion, which in the scripture, I don't have weeks on this, would be adultery, would be premarital sex, would be homosexuality, would be prostitution or transgenderism, pedophilia, incest. Those are all biblical terms under pornea, and I would include internet pornography. In fact, I just added that yesterday. I assume that all of us know that, but uh, I don't want to miss that. So it's an act or thought. It is quite an amazing thought that internet pornography, the business, is worth more than Major League Baseball, the NBA, and the NFL combined. And if you think those are major money makers into the billions, it puts you a little bit in just a a hushed sobriety to know that. So illicit sexual immorality was a problem. And he addressed it. And so I'm going to address it as Paul did it was, a, it was an issue for these new believers in the early church. And frankly, I don't think it's any different today. So listen, beloved, it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, I don't know if that verse comes up, your sanctification, which means holiness, the word sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. I mean, if a couple really wants to know if they're right for each other, you don't have a physical relationship. You abstain from it to ensure your holiness, to make sure that you're in the will of God. This is not an unclear standard in the Scripture. In fact, that word for sexual immorality is the Greek word pornea. Sometimes in certain translations, it's, it is translated fornication. When Paul talks about walking in the Spirit, and then he compares it to the deeds of the flesh, he said that the works of the flesh are evident, and those are, just to mention a few, it says in Galatians 5, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. So here is a clear command 
that we're not to conduct our life in any of these aspects of sin. In fact, Paul would say to you young men and to the church here in 1 Corinthians 6.18 to flee sexual immorality. Run from it. It is a perversion of God's perfect, beautiful, true love. He would say to us this morning in the hearing here, don't even let it be named among you. Not even a hint should it be mentioned, the thought would be, in the life of our church amongst us individually and corporately. Don't let it be named. And obviously he's going to help us with the proper means of the context in chapter 5 of a man and a woman coming together in marriage. But he says, he says, but sexual immorality, look at the text again. He adds another word there, very similar to immorality, but he calls it and all impurity, impurity. And this would include all kinds of impurity. You say, well, what does that word mean? Well, one writer said that it was used 11 times in the New Testament. And the first time that it was used, it was used by the Lord Jesus Christ who spoke of the vile, rotten stench that occurs when a body decays and it becomes filled with maggots. That's the first time it's used. And then the other ten times it's used, it is used of sexual perversion. So here, all impurity covers every kind of sexual sin, all immoral thoughts, all forms of sexual activity outside of marriage. Beloved, listen, I could take you through all of the scripture, but just a few places. Romans 1.24, when he gave the unbelieving world over to their lust, it says that he gave them up to the lust of their hearts in 124, to impurity, there's our word, to the dishonoring of their bodies. And he goes on to speak of homosexuality there where they took on what was not natural. In fact, Paul uses this word again in 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, where he has not called us to impurity. And in the context, he called us to be holy. It says in Galatians 5, 19, that there that the work of the flesh, remember, is sexual immorality. And he also mentions that word impurity. And so this is important. Beloved, let me just encourage you that one strategy of the devil, and especially to you singles here this morning, to all, but but one strategy of the devil is to distort and pervert every good gift that God has given to man. He lures and tempts you away from the worship of the one true God to worshiping his creation. He lures and tempts man away from the wonderful gift of marital intimacy to all kinds of filthy impurity. In fact, he presents the bait, but he hides the hook. And I just want to say he is a liar. Amen? He is a liar from the very beginning. But some would say, well, it's just wonderful. Just This love is wonderful and this woman that I left my first wife for is wonderful. And I would say, no, it isn't. You have bought the lie. That's the perversion of love. And Paul's going to say to you, he's going to say to me, he's going to say to all of our leaders, don't even let this be named among you. And the thought in one translation is, don't even let this be a hint. In other words, God's love is so pure. God is so holy. Christ loved you supremely. That's pure. That's sacrificial. In fact, what he's getting at here in the perversion of love is immorality is not pure. Impurity is impure. And it leads to the third sin of vice, the third perversion. Is it not interesting? Look at it in the text. Put your eyes there. He speaks of covetousness there. That's interesting to me. The Greek word is pleonexia, and it's the word we would use for greed. So if you have greed, okay, ESV has covetousness. But this is not here just any kind of coveting. I don't think he's in the context here of coveting a house or a car. 
or whatever it might be. But in this context, coveting, beloved, is inseparable from sexual immorality and impurity. Sexual immorality and impurity are expressions of a heart that is covetous in nature. In fact, I think the flow of the text here is this. From outward acts, immorality and impurity, they come from the inner heart of covening, which is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7. Covening in this context is an uncontrolled appetite that others exist, okay, for your own sexual gratification. That is the culture in which Ephesus lived and the one in which we lived. It is a perverted desire for more and more and more and more. More sexual immorality, more impurity. The heart of it is built off this word here, a covetous nature. In fact, you know this is true because it's spoken all over in the Old Testament, but just one scripture in Exodus 20, 17, you know it to be one of the Ten Commandments that you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. In fact, look back here in the book in 419. Look what he said about the unbelieving world here. And when he said, here's the old self, he says in 19, they've become callous, and have given themselves up to sensuality, and then this phrase, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And the truth is, Paul told us to take off the old self, to put on the new self, and Paul said in Colossians 3, 5, put to death what is earthly, even in you as a believer, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which Paul said amounts to idolatry. Listen, beloved, the sad and fearful truth is that while God's gift of marriage is beautiful, he's even provided it for the joy of the couple. The enemy's perversion never satisfies. I mean, if everybody was so happy It wouldn't be marked by greediness. So I'm saying be careful. He's going to present the bait and hide the hook. Therefore, the man or woman who listens to Satan's lies and their own flesh is never satisfied and is always greedy for more. It doesn't take a psychologist to psychoanalyze the human nature of fallen men. Listen, I would say to you from my heart to yours, so powerful are these types of sexual sins that some will sacrifice everything to satisfy their lustful desire. They'll destroy their home. They'll destroy their spouse. They'll destroy their children. They'll move away from all communication with friends. They'd lose their job to ever meet this deep need as they see it, which is not love, it's lust. Now remember, beloved, back up for a moment. Two weeks ago, we examined the love of Jesus Christ, which is entirely selfless, which is entirely self-giving. Here, the perversion of love is purely self-centered, and purely, uh, if you will, self-seeking. It is the opposite of giving and being others-minded. It is taking, it is narcissistic, it is a sin, and Paul says it can't be named in this place. And, And so to me, the motive isn't here. God's putting some, you know, don't do this, don't do this. I just know in my heart, and I think in your heart from the scriptures, I just want God to be honored. I want his glory to be seen. I want his character to be known. I want his fame to be demonstrated. I want his honor to be upheld. And so I would never want to stain, if you will, first and foremost, our vertical, holy relationship with God. Amen? Don't, don't, don't let it be named. I, I think I could restate it another way. Don't even get close to this. 
And that's what Paul's saying to us, and he's pleading with us. In fact, look at the text again. He says there, it must not be named among you. You'll notice that he says there, as is proper among the saints. And as appropriate among the saints. The key word there is saints. He used it in one one hagios. The saints aren't a little relic standing on a little shelf in a church. We've said this before. You're the saints. And the very etymology of the word saints is literally, you're the holy ones. He called you out. He redeemed you. He saved you. He forgave you. He covered all your sins. He put you and gave you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Listen, this is not proper amongst the ones that God has called out and set apart who encouraged us. In fact, go back to Ephesians 1.4. You say, well, why did he save me? To go to heaven? Why, well, certainly. <laughs> but you know in 1.4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, purpose clause, that we should be what? Holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us. He called you to be holy. So here are sins of conduct. But let me take you and go on to the sins of speech. To the sins of speech. And I I think I'm going to just put this in number four. The fourth perversion is sins of speech And there are three of them. And I think you need to know them as I do. He says in verse 4, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Fascinating. He said, high schoolers, at Emmanuel, at CVC, at Kingsburg High, for those who name Christ, there ought to be no filthiness. What is that? What is that? It's, it, it moves towards a spoken obscenity. Okay? That's filthiness. It would even be better to say, or obscene behavior. So it's both speech and behavior. I think it includes lewd gestures. I think it includes disgusting, practical jokes. But if I pinpointed it, no filthiness is speech that is disgusting or singing that is disgusting. It's filthiness in language or act that are and or filthy in entertainment. He says, listen, you can't have that be part of your communication. But look again, he says a second word there. We'll keep moving. He says, no filthiness nor foolish talk. That's kind of an interesting word, compound word we call it. I think you might even hear it in the Greek word. It's moro, moro logia, one word, two words. You know, I've been pushed together, compound word, from moros, which we use to describe someone that's a moron, is, is where that comes from. It's moronic, and it comes from logia, which is logos, which just is speech. So here he's saying, you've got to let go of any filthiness and hear nor foolish talk. It's moronic speech. I think it's very interesting that it was used in biblical times at banquets where heavy drunkenness took place and sexual immorality were common. That's the day in which we live. But he gives a third vice there in our speech. Look at it in verse 4. He says, nor foolish talk. And then thirdly, nor crude joking. Fascinating. It, it, it could be used at times positively if, if somebody has, I think that I would say this, clever wit. There, there's some people that are just witty and they're clever And you could use that in a redeeming way. But in this context, it's not speaking of clever wit. The phrase means to turn easily. That's what it means. To turn easily. And it speaks of those in this context who can turn a phrase into dirty talk. It is crude joking with sexual innuendo. 
I mean, this is the comedian stick, is it not? I mean, you just get up in front of people and just throw out a bunch of crude jokes. And somehow that's what gets a laugh and gets an audience. It's sexually vulgar speech. And I don't care if you're in seventh grade or sixth grade or eighth grade or ninth grade or you're in high school. This kind of filthy talk and sexual innuendo are out of place in the body of Christ. Out of place. I don't care what school you go to. Paul's saying here, it's not really funny. Listen, what is acceptable, and I'm not picking on anybody, okay? But what's acceptable in your school is not acceptable to God. In fact, Paul said, if you can see it, it's on the next page for me in verse 12. For it is shameful, verse 12 of 5, even to speak of things that they do in secret. Don't even let it be named among you. Not even a hint. And here the beauty and the joy is believers imitate God. Believers imitate Christ. Believers walk in love, not in sexual perversion. In fact, look again at verse 4. He says there that that crude joking then, which are out of, out of place, you understand that? We're the saints. We're holy. Totally, it's not proper. It's out of place. And then look at verse 4. But instead, uh, it's a command. Let there be thanksgiving. Just seems kind of odd, at least when I read it, humanly speaking. You would have thought that Paul would have said, rather, in all moral purity. <laughs> I, I, I suppose he could have, but that would be my human thought of what Paul should say. He doesn't say that. You say, well, what does he say? Well, look at it again in verse 4. Let there be what? thanksgiving is what he says. He says it's an imperative here. He wants you to give thanks. Rather than, I, I think the thought would be here, rather than selfish indulgence and greedy desires, you, beloved, ought to give thanks. You ought to be reminded of what God in Christ has done for you. Listen, a distinctive mark of believers is not sexual impurity, but it's rather thanksgiving. And here, rather than sexual perversion that is vulgar, crude, you and I ought to give thanks to the one who redeemed you from sin. So he says, listen, beware of the perversion of sexual sin. Secondly, beware of the certainty of judgment. Beware of the certainty of judgment. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, what does Paul mean? Well, look at verse five. For you may be sure of this, and what he generalized, he now personalized that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance, what a statement, in the kingdom of Christ or and God. Here's the certainty of judgment. He opens up and he said, you may be sure of this. And I think he might be trying to reason with you. And reason with me, you need to be sure of this. You know this, is the thought, without a shadow of a doubt. And what we know in that text is that no one who practices the sexual sin that was mentioned in verse 3 and 4 is in the kingdom of God or Christ. In other words, they don't inherit heaven, okay? That's the teaching of Scripture. Here, the language speaks of the kingdom of God and the present reign of God in Christ. Obviously, those are future benefits as well, but here it's the present rule. But it, it says here, look at the text again, that everyone, verse 5, who is sexually immoral, or impure, or covetous, he mentions this. That is a what? An idolater. In other words, the affections of a covetous person, those affections become idols. And people will go to any degree to accomplish, in some cases, their sinful desires. In fact, it's interesting that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, don't be idolaters. And then he went on to say, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some did. 
And it said, and 23,000 fell in a single day. So here, the desires of a person control the person, and they become their God, little g, or their idol. He said, be sure of this, that no one will inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, you might ask this question, certainly. How can we be given, truly, an inheritance in Ephesians 1.14 and in 1.18? How could we be given the guarantee of the Holy Spirit in 1.14 and yet have no inheritance in the coming kingdom? What's he talking about here? I had to read commentators who said that what they're going to lose is the loss of reward, that they'll go to heaven, but they're going to suffer the loss of their reward, but still go into that place of heaven. Listen, Paul is addressing here, I want to be clear, habitual, unrepentant sin. Paul does not say that no one whoever did these things in the past will not inherit the kingdom of God. Rather, no one who is sexually immoral, who is impure, who is covetous, is in possession of heaven. So here is a a severe warning, a certainty of judgment. Let me say it this way. Those who claim Christ but continue to live in immorality in impurity and greed as a habit of life are unsaved and unredeemed. They are not saved to say that. Paul is not stating that a believer who falls into sin, any of us could fall into sin, is excluded from God's kingdom. Rather, he is stating that the person who continually, persistently, habitually gives themselves over to sexual sin without repentance is excluded from heaven. So this you know. that This is the teaching of Scripture. It's stated right here, but I'll go on. Bring this up to the next verse in 1 Corinthians 5. I think it comes after this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. This guy's committed incest. And you are arrogant. Ought you rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as and is if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Listen, I guess I'm just reading that to you. Paul was very clear about this guy, about this man. And I just want you to know, it's tough to find a church that's even going to show this. But go on to the next slide, okay? It says, I wrote to you, just down in chapter 5, not letter to not, he said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people, not at all meeting, there's our word, pornea, the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would have to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, he uses this word again, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, Not even to eat with such a one. So beloved, we're just, this is a household talk here. Go to the next verse. It gets more descriptive. Do you not know? This is Paul. That the unrighteous shall not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. He tells you, and he'll tell us in 5, 6, to not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, there it is again, will inherit the kingdom of God and praise God. One of my favorite scriptures. And such were, what? Some of you. you used to be like that. What happened? It says that you were washed, cleansed, 
You were sanctified, made holy, positionally, moving towards that practically. You were justified, declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Go on, though. There, it's, it's in Ephesians, it's in Corinthians, the works of the flesh are evident. I've read part of this too, yeah? Sexual immorality, impurity, there they are. It, sensuality, there's idolatry again, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. He said, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things, we could say practice such things, do you see it there? will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's very clear. You know, beloved, that our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, workers of lawlessness. Listen, it's just so clear. And so I'm just saying this to you because I got to be faithful to the text. It doesn't mean we're not going to stumble at times and, and fall. But this stuff can't own you. This stuff can't master you. This stuff can't create a a, a habitual lifestyle of sin. You say, do Christians, Scott, stumble and fall? Yes. Says in 1.9 that he will, that God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can go to him, okay? But it is saying this, that there will be a decreasing frequency in sinful patterns and a growing hatred of sin and an increasing desire for holiness for whoever names Christ. That's what the Lord is saying. In other words, no one living in a continual life of immorality, impurity, who is unwilling to repent is genuinely saved, though they might say that. So here, he says, beware of the perversion of sexual sin and beware of the certainty of judgment. Let me just say a couple things specifically to you. If this is your lifestyle as I speak, I just want you to know that Christ died for your sins. If you but come to him, place your faith in him, repent of your sin, he will truly give you the salvation and the forgiveness of sin that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection. I just want to encourage you. There's grace this morning. He has the authority to forgive all your sins. He has the authority to wipe them all away. He has the authority to redeem you. He has the authority to forgive you. And if you're caught up in this, then I'm pleading with you, run to the cross. Run to the work of Christ. Run to him. And I think you know as I speak, they never satisfy because they're always demanding more. So that's first. Secondly, if you were once caught up in this sin... Once, you feel the pain of this truth. I understand that. But I want to remind you that even your presence today and even your sorrow over past sin is a testimony to God's grace. I'm not trying to make you fear this morning. Some of you might look back and say, oh, I, I, ah, but you've confessed that. You've moved on in obedience from that. You've showed that contrition of repentance over the past sin and just the fact that you're here today not wanting to walk into what I, Paul just described is a testimony. Paul has stated that these sins are not even to be named among you. But if Christ has redeemed you, if he's cleansed you, if he's forgiven you, if he's made you a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that the old things have passed away and the new things, what, have come. And so I'm asking you, is there a decreasing presence of sin that once owned you? 
Some of you might say, I've confessed that sin a thousand times. Listen, then your departure from that very sin is the fruit of God's gracious work in your life. You once walked in them, but you were washed. You'd say, yeah, I was. You were sanctified. I, I, I'm different than I used to be, yes. You'd even say, I'm, I'm justified, I'm forgiven. And that's what Paul would say to us by his affirmation here. Walk in love. Walk in holiness. You were saved, and I was saved to that purpose. And so maybe thirdly, I would say your role is to imitate God, his character, to walk in love like Christ. And I just want you to know as a church, we're going to be truthful here. We're going to be gracious here. But we are going to hold to a biblical standard both in our doctrine and practice. Amen? Listen, I know some of you, this could be your last Sunday. Because it could be that you've never heard anybody say anything like Paul would. But I want you to know that he packs it in the midst of the gospel. And let me just have one final statement to you. Listen, don't ever forget, and you know this, and I'm reminding you of this, that God created, God created, he created the physical union of a man and woman in the context of marriage. Amen? He's the one who created physical intimacy. And so when a man or woman are married, it is pure in that context. So listen, you say, well, why would, why would Paul tell us all of this? For your joy? For your happiness? Maybe you're single in here and, and you're not married and you're thinking, I'd like to get married. And you're trusting and content in his sovereignty in your life. But he would never withhold any good from you. And you need to ever trust his promises and purpose, purposes. And let me just say this. You families. I, I, I used to say when they're in junior high, you families, when they're in elementary school, be helping your kids in proper language to, to exalt purity and at the appropriate point exalt the physical intimacy bound up within God's demand of a marriage. But listen, he only wants to bless you. And listen, you say, well, 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 who are those people? And is there more in that text? Yes, but I'll pick it up next week with you, okay? Would you bow your head with me?